Um, okay, so the purpose of this, uh, this presentation is to give you an update on some of the new measurements uh, that we've collected as part of the, of part of the MARES in the Eastern Beaufort Sea. Um, this project is uh, funded under NOP, uh, the lead agency is BOEM and been really the main funder and there's a few other uh, agency or organizations that have contributed to bits and pieces of it. But the part that I'll be talking about today is really uh, uh, primarily, well, the, the funding comes from BOEM. STATIC is the lead of this uh, really multidisciplinary, multi-organization effort, but there's lots of other um, collaborators here, and, uh, and you'll see some of them listed in the bottom, not all of them for the things I'm going to talk about today, but for the project uh, overall. So the overall goal here, just to put in context for, for Mares, is to kind of better understand this interrelationship between the biophysical chemical drivers and the trophic structure and function in the eastern in the Eastern Beaufort Sea. And uh, for 2016, which is what I'll be presenting, we kind of had three main objectives. Uh, the first one, it was just to collect data from a glider as well as from, and, and from moorings. Um, really try to figure out what the, how useful information are that we can get from a glider and what can we learn from it. And then do some uh, sediment sample and, and figure out what we can learn about the carbon cycling processes that occur in this particular region. So we're working in the Eastern Beaufort Sea. This is kind of our study region here. Um, the the U.S.-Canadian border is uh, right here. And so we're right across the border. This is the Mackenzie Trough. Uh, we have a series of moorings here that go from 25 meter depth all the way to about 750 meters. The moorings I'm gonna talk about, well, that it will show that, that of Mares funded are these four here in the middle, but we have collaboration with UAF as well as DFO which are the green moorings here that's going to give us a broader spatial and temporal context uh, down the road. So we have three components, um, the moorings, the other part is the glider uh, work, which was led by Dong Lai Gong from BIMS, and we had a, uh, a uh, glider deployment here between mid-August and early October. You can see the planned track here up in the top right. Um, and it was equipped with a whole bunch of uh, physical, biological, uh, chemical sensors, and they're listed here, and I'll show some of the results about that. Uh, five moorings that I talked were deployed here, because the DFO moorings, the green ones, were deployed before. You can see them here, so they're gonna go cross shelf, um, and some of them are in the trough. We also took a series of water samples here, and then the array of those middle, sh the, those middle shelf moorings, which you call M1, M2, M3, and M4 here, um, uh, you can see it here, and there's a whole bunch of different sensors on there and with lots of data uh, coming, coming our way. And then the third component is the sediment component, uh, which is really to understand this carbon cycling and figuring out uh, what goes into the sediments, what not, and how that impacts the benthic community. So we took benthic graphs, we took water samples, um, and you can, you can see some of those here. So I want to talk about the results of this latter two. The moorings uh, we got deployed in October 2016. They actually got retrieved and redeployed in late September of 2017. And so we're working through those data, but there's a lot of them, so that's ongoing. So I can't quite speak to that yet, but I'll talk about the glider analysis, and I'll talk about the sediment uh, biochemistry and benthic myofauna. So the glider portion here is actually an extract of a presentation that Ong Lai gave at the Ocean Sciences meeting just recently. So I'll, I'll uh, give a couple of highlights there, but certainly recognize uh, his, his leadership in the, in, the, in the glider work as well as his, uh, his postdoc. So Mackenzie River, um, you know, is a major input into the Arctic, as we all know. It actually has a flow of about 10,000 cubic meters per second average per day. A uh, huge watershed that goes all the way down to Edmonton, Canada, as you can see here, and you can see the comparison um, with other global rivers. So the input, both in terms of freshwater volume as well as in sediment, is actually really large. And the peak of this outflow is uh, mid-May, generally here you can see, and uh, for obvious reasons with ice and other logistics, we couldn't be there in mid-May to do the glider deployment. And we did it here. So this is the mid mid August to early um, October, which is obviously in the downslope, but there's actually still quite a bit of volume. You see somewhere between 15 and 20,000 or 25,000 uh, meters per second are coming into this region. 
And then if we look at the major, this is a known picture. Everybody kind of sees this, and we've lost the graphics that show this, the major currents in the Chukchi and Beaufort Sea, but the general intent here is, of course, we have this shelf break that goes east, and then we have the Beaufort Gyre, which goes uh, counterclockwise. And that's kind of the picture that's been kind of painted over time. Um, and our study region is right here, and the question is, with this major input here, what actually happened to you? And does it go this way, does it go that way, and what are the implications and what are the main, the main drivers? So the glider was deployed um, just, uh, just east of Kaktovik, and uh, you can see here it's quite messy, so the, the plan actually was this one here, and may appear to be like a drunken driver of the glider, but it had a lot of, um, there was a lot of current, there was a lot of different cross-shelf winds that made it uh, pretty close. Um, to what we're looking for, really focusing on this area here, which is where the moorings are located, and then this area here, which is the Mackenzie Trough. And we did this a couple of times in the, in, the, in the period of time that the glider was deployed. So then when we look at this here, you can see we get lots of information on salinity, temperature, oxygen, uh, CDOM, you know, backscatter, and so on. And this is the profile across, and there's a lot of cool things in here which I really don't have time to talk about. The data is pretty rich. But I want to focus um, on, on two things. I want to highlight quickly to show that there is a lot of um, topographic interactions, especially if you look, for example, here along the canyon axis, um, how things go against the slope. So this is land on the water here. Um, and you can see some of the features that are, that are uh, interacting with, with the topography here in different ways. And that leads to a lot of other uh, physical implications that um, uh, I can't talk about now, but that, that we're pursuing as well. But one of the main things that really has come out of this that we observed even in the short period of time that the glider was there uh, between August and October is that there's really two main modes of how the system seems to be operating and that uh, figures out what the fate of fresh water and the plume are. And one of them are is this one here where you have the, the winds from the southwest and uh, it's creating um, this, uh, this uh, different oceanographic regime here. And you can see then the movement of water and the plume here off of Herschel Island is going, is going eastward um, and creating um, a, uh, um, a, a downwelling uh, situation. And so the, um, uh, you can see, we can see it in the main currents here. We can see it in the geostrophic flow. Um, and we could see it when we look at some of the different, uh, different regimes in terms of the stuff really being um, pushed, pushed down. The other one is the opposite. When the winds go the other way, the winds come from the southeast, you can see now the plume is going the opposite, the opposite direction. Uh, it creates, um, it creates uh, downwelling and it, uh, it, it then goes and gets entrained into the Beaufort Gyre. And again, here we see the same uh, evidence for those in terms of the current vectors, the geostrophic flow, um, and the profiles as we're putting them forward. So, sorry, sorry, I may have said uh, it creates upwelling, sorry. So this is really relevant, um, and it's mostly happened in the September time period. So we looked and figured out, we wanted to see, well, is September really weird? Is it just uh, different from all the other things that we see? So we went for the NSEP reanalysis and looked at September in other years. So this is our year here, 2016, compared it to 2011, um, and found that it indeed is actually really quite different. So the intra-annual intra variability is actually quite significant. It's also shown if we look at sea surface height. So this is the high calm, um, and you can see the currents here are much stronger because you get much more sea surface height um, in, this, in the 2011, which is strong easterly winds as opposed to when the winds are somewhat weaker. Then we thought, okay, maybe September is just weird, and the other, um, and the other months are much more uniform across years. And, but we found, so we looked at July um, across years and found basically the same. So this is July 2016 and July 2011, and again, you see a really different regime, which again is uh, shown in the sea surface height, and again is shown um, uh, in, in the geostrophic flows. So then we thought, okay, well, maybe 2016 and 2011 are just weird, and maybe this is just a one-year weird off. And so we looked at multi-year variability of these winds and what it's creating and how it's set up. And uh, so we look at the 2012-2017 period, where, of course, Aon and DBO has been quite active, 
And this regime really differs from the one that from 20, 2005 to 2011, when some of the other programs were going, and where actually some of the main uh, insights in terms of what the currents are doing or what the cur normal current setups are were set up. And it again is different from what was done earlier in the 2000s by SBI, for example, really showing a whole bunch of different things. So really that led, then the question then becomes, of course, if there's all these different regimes, is this picture really the right picture? Um, and, and what are uh, the ways that we should really think about this? Or are the, when do the currents go the other way and what are the implications? And, and as far as we can tell, I mentioned this is for, from this one year of data and we got to do the integration across multiple years and with the mooring data, but it really seems to be wind driven and the, and the resulting intensity of the Beaufort gyre. And we can even take a broader look and say, okay, well, and so this is 1994 to 2017. These are monthly data of the wind speeds along the shelf slope. And, uh, and you can see it really differs. And so the direction and upwelling and downwelling uh, would really differ depending on what these winds are doing. And so we gotta be really careful about drawing these conclusions of what the current regimes in this area might be and what the fate of plume, fresh water, oil spill, whatever it is, may actually be uh, in this region. It might not quite be how we thought about it. So then the main takeaways from this glider work uh, is really that the winds are, appear to mean the drivers in this uh, Mackenzie shelf and canyon circulation and that the variability, especially in summertime, really affect the structure of the gyre but also the boundary condurn and, and the boundary uh, current as well as the downstream effects of this river water. And so we think uh, that really in years when the average summertime winds are really strongly from the east, like was historically between 2005 and 2011, the water's upwell and then it flows westward. And that really means that all that fresh water and all that organic matter goes onto the shelf towards the U.S., but gets entrained into the Beaufort Gyre, the freshwater does, and maybe trapped for long periods of time in the Arctic. And that residence time is in the gyre is 20 to 30 years and has quite a bit of implications to then that dynamic. On the other hand, when the winds are weak, the river goes the other way. It gets downwelled, it flows eastward into the Canadian archipelago, it can act, exit the Arctic much faster, and that is in a, in a period of a couple of years. And there's obviously then the connectivity to that side of the Arctic in that way, which is really different. So the, this period where we've established this regime of how this current works in this area, um, that really comes from this, primarily from this time between 2005 and 2011, really actually appears to be somewhat exceptional. The, the winds were much stronger um, in that period of time than any before or since then. And these upwelling conditions and this plume going westward may not be exactly what happens all the time and needs to be investigated yeah. further. Mm -hmm. So then the question is, is, okay, so that's the physics. So what does that actually mean then for the organics um, in this case? And so. This is part of work that this uh, in collaboration with Old Dominion University and uh, I'll show a quick extract of a poster um, that uh, uh, Roger Harvey and Pam Newbert and Rachel McMahon and I did um, for the Marine Science Symposium this year. Um, where really we're, we're after this, con this connectivity between the physics and the biology and where the carbon comes from. So in context, there's a lot of carbon that comes from the Mackenzie River. Um, supplies, you know, two, a little over two metric tons per year and is really the largest sediment load river input into the Arctic Ocean as a result. And you add to that some of the autochthonous primary production in the Delta and you add another three or so uh, metric tons a year of POC as well. And the idea here is that um, the majority of this actually doesn't reach the underlying sediment. It gets recycled in the water column. Um, and uh, and it's, it's gone and we don't pick it up in the sediments and the myofauna or infauna may not actually, or epifauna may not actually benefit from it. And that the majority in this region really uh, is that the, the thought is it comes from terrestrial outflow um, up to perhaps 40% of the sediment organic matter maybe from the river or so, or so we thought. So we wanted to understand this better. So we took water samples, we took sediment samples, we did a whole bunch of um, isotope and fatty acid analysis, did species IDs, biomass and abundance of the myofauna. I won't bore you here with the details, but really the, the, I'll show you some of the highlights of the results. So one is that the grain size, which often is an indication of what species are there, seems to be pretty uh, uniform um, across the shelf. 
and also suggests because it's throughout the depth that there's not a lot of sorting um, uh, prior to transport and deposition which happens in some other area. The overall organic carbon in the sediments was actually pretty low, but mind you, this was October, so it was below 2%, which is, throughout, which is really low for coastal systems of this kind comparison to uh, other places in the Arctic. Um, and the values of, of POC were highest at the mid-shelf regions. If you remember those four or five moorings, so the middle ones, FM2 and M3, had the highest um, particular organic carbon. The fatty acids, um, the different fatty acids show different uh, signatures and relate to different parts of the ecosystem and sources. And so in this case, for example, phytol, which is, has relate, is related to chlorophyll, um, showed increase um, in mid-shelf. And so this would indicate uh, increase in marine-related biomarkers in the middle shelf as opposed to other places like sterols, for example, which was higher increase right close to the shore at station um, M1. And again, an overall fatty acids, which touches, talks about biological activity um, in the water and in the sediment, was again highest at these middle stations. And, and this is also uh, you know, shown in overall, uh, um, uh, the sum of fatty acids is highest in the middle shelf. And if we look at the biomarkers, they seem to be mostly related to, di related to diatoms um, rather than other phytoplankton, um, which actually matches well with what we see in the myofaunal size class. And some of that is shown here. So again, um, uh, for manifera, so we have abundance and diversity really dominated at the middle here. So in this bottom right graph here, you can see that there's more of them and they're more diverse than in other places. Um, we see that the, the most abundant uh, kind of classes are the for manifera, so surface deposit feeders, but that actually, even though they dominate uh, abundance, there, there are other organisms um, which, although low in abundance, are actually quite diverse. So for example, we found over 23 families of polychaetes, 19 species of uh, crustaceans in the samples. And see, these are kind of myoformal samples. So there's interesting things going on. The question, of course, is how do they all relate? So the takeaway here of this portion then is that uh, the, the, we, it seems to be this enriched uh, uh, algal input in the mid-shelf system as opposed to the nearshore or offshore, uh, and they're from diatoms and not other phytoplankton. It's not grain size driven um, as we, we think uh, in other places here. And so it really, even though these are only a few samples, we've sampled four spots below where the moorings are, and we haven't analyzed all the mooring data, we have only one year. The, it really looks like the, um, the organic sources and the myobenthic diversity is driven by um, the marine inputs to the sediment, not, not the river deposition. And, uh, and so, of course, if you think back to what we just learned from the physics, um, that means really that that plume and the, the, the wind regimes and the oceanography that's driven drives us to the middle shelf in this particular occasion, but that may be just in this one year. And we don't know what the residence times are, and we don't know what the overall carbon budgets are, and really for that, we need to repeat the, the, the sediment work one more time, and then we'll have to put it together with the rest of the, uh, of the mooring data that we're analyzing now. So that's the plan forward. You know, we're working on the year one mooring. We're gonna, the current plan is to retrieve the mooring array, take it out in October, uh, we're still working on the, how feasible it might be to go sediment sampling again. It'd be really nice to bound those and to get and actually relate them to what happened in the two years of data we'll have from the moorings and then do one more sediment sampling at the end to repeat it. Um, but we don't know that's going to happen yet. Um, of course, then we're going to do the year and two analysis. And then we'll integrate it across years and, of course, with these other activities. So with the, the mooring, with the glider, with the sediment work as well as with all the data that we have from our partners from DFO that have been doing this for many years, at least from the physical standpoint, the physical moorings that they have. So that we hopefully can get to the point where we can ha make, you know, make some inferences about um, what the, the, trophic, uh, the, the impact on the trophic structures are, including you know, impact on species for subsistence down the line, as well as other implications. So these, these oceanographic regimes and modes really drive what would happen to an oil spill, for example, and impact on resources in the future. And, uh, and, and that needs to be tied, tied together. 
um, and we'll have we'll have two years of moorings, and we'll have the data we got, and we'll do our best job that we can to kind of put those together. Um, I like the I like the idea to you know um, to tie this really together, this more benthic sampling and perhaps another glider mission, but certainly to putting it together with some of the modeling efforts before perhaps the ongoing or others um, would kind of, I think, round that out quite nicely and we'll be able to talk more about it um, as the data analysis progresses. Thanks, that's all I got. Thank you, Francis. Uh, that was very comprehensive. Aria, uh, we have time for one quick question for uh, Francis. Hey, Guillermo, this is uh, Matt Baker at MPRB. Um, uh, Francis, great, great talk. I was wondering, in the retrospective analysis, you kind of described um, a wind-driven system along the Beaufort coast, and I'm wondering what an extended uh, open water season in the summer um, might mean for increased fetch, and how that would, um, you know, either strength, presumably strengthen those different regimes, um, and and what that might mean in terms of ice retreat further into the Arctic basin, if you have just more open water there in general, either extended time or extended spatial extent. Yeah, it's a good question. So I'm not sure we have the answer quite yet. So we'll have the, the mooring data actually has ice profilers. And so we'll be able to see what some of the ice cover, how it relates to some of the physics that we see across the shelf and what some of those impacts might be. Um, there is currently no modeling as part of uh, what we're doing here, but we hope to link it up to maybe some other model to look at the broader the broader system uh, with the open with the open water season. Um, but but certainly you know the the prevalence of these winds with more with more open water will just strengthen those regimes. I think it'll just it'll just demark those two modes more even more so and and distances from themselves and how they operate and what the fates of those are even more so than probably have seen in the past. That's my best my best guess for now. Great, thanks. Thank you uh, again, Francis. Uh, we really look forward to. To know more about um, the mooring data once it becomes uh, processed and analyzed, uh, we look forward to uh, take a look at those results. Uh, Daniel, um, your ne your next uh, agenda item is yours. Sure, thank you. So next up, I'd like to introduce Kathy Kuhn. She's the chief for the Environmental Sciences Management. Uh, for the Bureau of Ocean Energy Man Management in the Alaska region, and she's going to give us an overview of what BOEM is doing here in Alaska. So, Kathy, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks. Hey, thanks, Danielle. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, I just want to point out that uh, here at BOEM in our Environmental Studies Program, we're a team of seven physical, social, and biological scientists, and many of us participate in several of the IARPIC teams. I also wanted to point out um, that I'm just going to do a quick overview of our program and give a few examples of our research activities that are enhanced by multi-agency collaboration and that also align well with the IARPIC goals and the specific performance elements. The environmental studies program aligns well with strong interagency communication, coordination, and collaboration to best serve the needs of all stakeholders. Uh, and in brief, uh, the mission of the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management is to manage development of the U.S. Outer Continental Shelf, energy and mineral resources in an environmentally and economically responsible way. Our statutory authorization is derived primarily from the OSLA, the Outer Continental Shelf Lands Act, Section 20, and also the National Environmental Policy Act. Our specific mission is to provide information needed to predict, assess, and manage impacts from offshore energy and marine mineral exploration development and production activities on the human marine and coastal environments. Uh, in 1973, our Environmental Studies Program was initiated to support DOI's offshore oil and gas lease program. We use the information from the studies for our NEPA documents as well as to contribute to the overall scientific knowledge of Alaska and determine steps to avoid, mitigate, or monitor the impact of energy development on the OCS. Uh, we also uh, adhere to other federal laws um, that impose additional requirements on the offshore leasing process. These include the Marine Mammal Protection Act, the Endangered Species Act, the Magnuson-Stevens Fishery Conservation and Management Act, and others. 
Um, in our program, uh, we develop, conduct, and oversee world-class scientific research. I like to point that out because I think a lot of our PIs are on the phone and we appreciate your hard work on this. We currently have about 65 ongoing projects and um, we actually are, are proud to say that we have a, a very large investment over the 40 years of our program, about 500 million um, in the Alaska OCS region and that's allowed us internally to um, have a thousand technical reports in peer review journal articles uh, since our inception. Um, again, um, it's the OSLA Section 20 that authorizes the Environmental Studies Program to exist, and it also establishes our three goals for the program. Uh, the first is to conduct baseline studies that provide information needed for the assessment and management of environmental impacts on the human, marine, and coastal environments and potentially affected coastal areas. Also impact studies uh, to predict impacts on the marine biota that might result from OCS activities. And finally, monitoring studies to monitor the human, marine, and coastal environments to provide time series and data trend information for identifying significant changes in the quality and productivity of these environments, as well as for designing studies to identify the causes of these changes. Um, so just to highlight, um, up on the slide, we have the different uh, components of how we conduct environmental studies, uh, as well as socioeconomic studies, and we are uh, very strong on traditional knowledge and community input. Um, we have completed over 500 studies through the 40 plus years, um, 65 are ongoing. We have 16 studies with our Coastal Marine Institute, our relationship with the University of Alaska Fairbanks that we strongly support. And um, we are looking to have um, approximately 12 um, new studies to be reviewed for FY19. Uh, I just have to highlight um, that partnerships are key. Uh, we oversee our scientific research through contracts, uh, cooperative agreements with state institutions, including universities and uh, inter and intra-agency agreements. Uh, we're strong participants in the National Oceanographic Partnership Program. Um, both uh, the Mares Project and the Ambon Project are part of that, and we've had longstanding relationships with uh, other key agencies, NOAA, um, both the National Marine Mammal Lab and National Marine Fisheries Service and the Weather Service, also USGS, um, US Fish and Wildlife Service, and um, our partnership with the North Pacific Research Program as they embark on their um, integrated Arctic research program. Uh, just to point out a couple examples of our studies that apply to the um, IARPIC research goals. One of our partnerships is with the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium who have pioneered the Local Environmental Observer Network, also known as LEO, and this is guided by Mike Brubaker. LEO is a citizen observer system for monitoring environmental change. It falls under IARPIC's research goal number one, health and well-being, and the specific performance element it is tied to is 1.1, which is to support community-based monitoring and indigenous knowledge and local knowledge by maintaining and strengthening the LEO network to help describe connections between climate change, environmental impacts, and health effects. Uh, LEO is also supported by the EPA. It's a mapping and social network tool that allows community members to document unusual environmental events and to connect with people who have topical expertise. The network itself um, is online and it has uh, documented hundreds of observations about unusual environmental events across Alaska. And if you haven't taken a look, I'd, I'd recommend that you go to uh, their uh, website, uh, leonetwork.org. Um, please go explore or contribute to it. And I believe that uh, Michael Brubaker has given a presentation, um, I think within the last year on one of the other IARPIC teams, although I could be wrong. The next several slides are going to give examples of our BOEM uh, research under IARPIC Goal 4, which is to increase understanding in the structure and function of the Arctic marine ecosystems and their role in climate science and advanced predictive capabilities. Uh, this first slide is an example of that work that Lori Quakenbush and her team from the Alaska Department of Fish and Game are conducting, um, and that's a project entitled Satellite Tracking of Bowhead Whales, uh, looking at their habitat use, passive acoustics, environmental monitoring. This applies to the IARPIC Goal 4.1.1, which is Continued Distribution and Abundant Surveys of Arctic Marine Species. Uh, this project provides information on the locations and use of bowhead whale feeding areas, the variability of those locations from year to year, and the environmental factors that can be used to project where bowhead whales will concentrate. 
the information can be used for developing mitigation options for OCS oil and gas activities in both the uh, Beaufort and Chuck GCs. It provides information on the vocal behavior of bowhead whales under various environmental conditions and is needed to interpret the habitat use and call behavior being collected on many of the passive acoustic recorders currently in use. Uh, information from this study helps support um, BOEM's ESA Section 7 consultation as well as NEPA documentation. I just want to point out um, that satellite link transmitters are a valuable tool for tracking bowhead whales and they have been effective at documenting movements of large and small whales of both sexes and the timing and locations of concentration areas. Another tool um, increasing use is the, a passive acoustic recorders deployed near areas of interest to record marine mammal vocalizations. Um, recorded bowhead vocalizations indicate that a bowhead whale was present at the time of a vocalization, but the absence of calls could mean bowhead whales are present but not vocalizing. Bowhead whale vocalization rates are related to various behaviors, including uh, feeding and traveling, or potential disturbances, including boat traffic, seismic operations, and drilling. And that information is needed to interpret uh, the information being collected by the passive acoustic recorders. My next example also uh, is uh, looking at a project uh, by the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, and that falls under uh, performance elements 4.1.1 and 4.1.3, and this is the ice seal movements and foraging um, and the village-based satellite tracking and acoustic monitoring of ringed bearded and spotted seals and uh, a collection of TEK. Um, I know when Lori presents this uh, uh, slide in public, uh, which she does frequently, she gives a sincere thanks to the hunters and whaling for sharing their traditional knowledge and indigenous knowledge and for helping capture the tagged animals. Um, they also um, uh, provide these weekly uh, movements. I didn't have a, a chance to update it for this last week, um, but you can um, get on her email distribution list and get um, weekly um, uh, depictions of where uh, the seals that are tagged are moving. And also, if you look at their website uh, here um, and you go back through previous years, you can kind of see a, a rolling uh, script of where uh, the ice seals are moving. Um, the objective of this study is to better understand movements and habitat use of the ice seals in the Beaufort, Chukchi, and Northern Bering Seas. It's a tagging project uh, conducted in Kotzebue Sound by the native village of Kotzebue. It's a model to um, develop similar collaborations uh, between local village councils, seal hunters, and the ice seal committee and other partners, including North Slope Borough, ADF&G, uh, NIMS, and BOEM, to establish seal tagging projects near several native communities selected for the importance in providing missing seal movement information. Um, I think a, a key uh, enhancement of this project is biologists have trained hunters in seal capture and tag deployment, and uh, again, uh, pointing out to the, uh, the weekly maps of the seal tracks. Um, those are provided to hunters and the communities as well as uh, any stakeholder that's interested. Uh, they also analyze the movement data um, in real relationship to the ice edge, ice concentration, bathymetry, and residence times. Another uh, longstanding project I'd like to uh, point out is the Aerial Survey of Arctic Marine Mammals. Uh, this is, again, an example of performance element 4.1.1. Uh, this research documents the relative abundance and distribution of marine mammals in the Chukchi and Beaufort Seas. Uh, this has been our longstanding project. Aerial surveys um, have begun in the Beaufort Sea since 1979, originally by BLM and then um, subsequently by MMS and now BOEM. And, and NOAA has been, um, NOAA Marine Mammal Lab has been conducting this for some time. But this is one of our long, longest maintained monitoring programs of a biological phenomena and has produced an invalu invaluable baseline of the distribution and habitat of uh, bowhead whales and other species. Uh, the baseline can be used to observe changes in distribution and habitat use that might occur due to changing atmospheric and oceanic climates, um, especially related to uh, OCS oil and gas development activities. Uh, the, doc, the investigation uh, documents aerial observers of the um, observations of fall uh, migration for evidence of these changes. And um, often other animals are seen, um, but the, I think the project was initially um, 
uh, precipitated by the movements of bowhead whales. Um, but key things that um, frequently um, our partners at NOAA mention when they're giving presentations is that uh, this survey is very helpful for understanding uh, interannual variability. Um, that's become increasingly important. Um, you know, we've been seeing implications of changing um, regional winds and currents. Um, Franson just uh, talked about that in his uh, Mari's presentation. Uh, this project also helps with the timing, location, um, and the size of walrus land haulouts and uh, helping support no-fly zones when those uh, terrestrial haulouts occur. Um, it also helps support um, ice coverage uh, and allows uh, vessels uh, to ground truth some of the satellite imagery. Um, as they're flying um, over these surveys, they uh, alter the altitude and coverage to avoid uh, subsistence activities. And uh, in any given year, they cover uh, roughly over 100,000 kilometers of area, and they typically fly from uh, July 1st through um, October 31st year, uh, each year. And um, uh, I know they're not on the line today, but um, uh, definitely a special thanks to um, Megan uh, Ferguson at NOAA MIMO, as well as uh, Janet Clark and countless others who've been working over this, uh, working on this project over the last four decades. Uh, now, um, I have an uh, example that uh, guides performance element 4.1.2, and that's to continue studies to document Arctic marine species biodiversity, um, for example, the AMBON project and other programs that monitor loss of sea ice and habitat use in the Arctic, uh, and also to ensure these data sets are available through open access portals. Um, I know Katrin is on the line, and uh, also Jackie, and I think Liz uh, Lebunsky for the sea observer might have been a seabird observer on the program. And I also know that Katrin gave a presentation to this uh, group a little over a year ago, and perhaps we'll do so again with some preliminary results from the 2017 field efforts. But the importance um, of this to the Arctic Ocean, uh, to global climate and ecosystem processes, and the speed at which climate changes are already occurring in the Arctic, elevate the urgency for coordinated observations on Arctic marine biodiversity. Uh, the project here um, is an end-to-end -end approach looking at microbes to whales and the AMBON science experts work with the Alaska Ocean Observing System to coordinate data streams from past and ongoing projects into one observation for the U.S. Arctic. Um, I know that uh, Katrin uh, might actually agree to say that, uh, you know, the eyes are on the Arctic and uh, AMBOM, there's other a national program um, for mon uh, marine biodiversity observation networks. And I think when they embarked on this project, they didn't know that they were going to um, be intersecting um, as much on the national program, um, which involves meeting and, and other coordinations. But I think it's key with um, the Arctic and other marine biodiversity observation networks is to have effective data management and integration and dissemination uh, that'll help provide information on the status of Ar Arctic ecosystem health and resilience to decision makers, as well as local, regional, and global communities. Um, now, I think it's uh, worth noting that the AMBON PIs, um, again, several are on the line, are actively engaged in the um, IARPIC, uh, which is, provides an excellent uh, tool to update um, IARPIC members and learn about other initiatives. Um, and it's also a val valuable tool to make um, research accessible to resource managers, um, including our agency. Uh, AMBON is also uh, recognized and contributes to several international Arctic programs. Um, a couple that are noteworthy are the Circumpolar Biodiversity Monitoring Program of the Arctic Council under CAF. Uh, uh, Katrin, uh, Russ, uh, uh, Collins, and Kulitz are all um, the CBMP representatives um, on that working group or that expert group. And um, the Pacific Arctic Group has emphasis with Korea, China, Canada, US, Russia, and Japan. And clearly, Jackie is um, representative of that. Um, also, Franz Muter is a representative on the ecosystem studies of subarctic seas, um, specifically the regional program of uh, marine biogeochemistry and ecosystem research. So, you know, the US Arctic has uh, interface with other pan Arctic. Uh, observations. Uh, but just in brief, this is a five-year research program under the um, National Ocean um, Partnership Program, and it's a collaboration between several university and federal in, uh, investigators and integrates well with our Alaska Ocean Observing System. Uh, this uh, example um, moves into a different performance element of uh, 
8.1.1, which is to engage community members in research by seeking co cooperative opportunities between community members, indigenous knowledge holders, and or local knowledge holders, um, and researchers together to um, produce co-production um, research processes. And uh, this isn't a current study um, that we are uh, doing right now, but it is one that we're particularly proud of, and that's the Cross Island Subsistence Bowhead uh, Whale Mapping Project. Uh, so this uh, depiction here on the left is uh, of uh, GPS tracks uh, done um, collected by the hunters. Uh, Michael Galganitis of Applied Sociocultural Research in Anchorage uh, uh, did this, and this um, was to um, uh, look at traditional knowledge about whale behavior, um, and it was to emphasize Inupiat concerns that industrial activities would impact hunting success. So the hunters were um, provided with GPS units to record the boat tracks of when they're hunting and um, the whale strikes um, in um, over uh, a couple decades worth of information. And um, here on the left, um, uh, Chris Campbell, who's been championing this project for years, just pointed out that this you know, here this looks like a whole large area where the whale hunters go, but uh, the um, hunters from Nuiqsut would prefer to um, hunt closer to home because the whale meat is uh, a better quality and it's uh, uh, safer. But as the sea ice retreats, um, they oftentimes go further out from shore. Um, this is a potential project uh, we're looking for for um, future work and the Anubia uh, traditional knowledge states that bowhead whales deflect from anthropogenic noises and Nuiqsut hunters engage in subsistence harvest of bowhead whales at Cross Island, uh, which is west of our proposed Liberty development. Uh, whalers are concerned that noise generated at that site will cause the bowhead whales to deflect from Cross Island since they potentially will encounter anthropogenic noise from Liberty when they migrate from east to west. And then deflection could result in the reduction of harvesting and negatively affect cultural practices, um, the sharing networks and the feasting where bowhead whales is primarily served. So if this project were to kind of move forward into the future, um, it would try to uh, produce um, or uh, intervene by developing a concern, uh, researching the concern that anthropogenic noise generated by liberty development and production and associated vessel and aircraft traffic uh, would, res would document whether it results in whale deflection away from Cross Island. So uh, future research would continue uh, as it did historically, um, which would be monitoring the hunt, um, identifying the sources of disturbance and witnessing the harvest uh, and fencing and identifying the hunter's tracks. Uh, just uh, a couple um, other uh, projects I'd like to um, mention are the um, ones that are ecosystem studies and synthesis. Uh, we've had several new issues of deep sea research too. Um, the first is the Arctic Ecosystem Integrated Surveys, uh, work that was done by NOAA and UAF, and they produced a nice um, compendium of about, I think, 18 different uh, uh, of a different uh, peer-reviewed journal articles looking at the marine ecosystem dynamics in a rapidly changing Pacific Arctic Gateway. Um, one also, um, I think recently came out, Heather can chime in, on the Hannah Scholl Ecosystem Study. Again, it probably covers like 17 to 18 peer-reviewed journal articles. And um, I think we're expecting the second issue soon of uh, the synthesis of Arctic marine research. And I know that uh, Jackie Grebmeyer is on the line for that. But uh, that, in a nutshell, um, covers our program and some specific projects that we have ongoing that help um, um, meet some of the IARPIC uh, goals and performance elements. Thanks so much, Kathy. That was a really wonderful presentation. It covered quite a lot of information. Thanks so much. Um, I'm, I'm going to pose one quick question. I know we're running over time, but I'd like to allow uh, time for additional questions, too. Oh, excuse me, do you want to go ahead with your question? Yes, uh, thank you, Kathy. That was uh, a great presentation. And I want to emphasize that um, your program and your staff manage many other projects in addition to the one that you just uh, showed us. H how many ongoing projects uh, are, is the region managing currently? I believe it's 65. Heather could probably correct me if not, but we are yeah, remiss. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I think that we're about to, we want to tally them um, in terms of all the IARPIC um, research goals. Um, and uh, we haven't we haven't done it up to date yet for the current research plan. Thanks. And and the the other question is, um, you just mentioned anthropogenic noise, um, perhaps in connection with um, the Liberty Project. Is there any current uh, monitoring since we have here uh, Stan in the room? Um, any monitoring of um, um, noise in the area or nearby, either by bomb or any other agencies? Uh, that's a good question, and I'll, I'll see if um, Heather is willing to chime in. But my understanding is that uh, Hillcore, um, who is proposing the development, um, perhaps has been doing some monitoring. But that is something that uh, isn't actively happening, and um, you know, the effects of um, industrial development in the soundscape of the ocean is is clearly a, a key concern. Thank you. Um, this is Heather. Uh, yeah, I believe we do not currently have any um, acoustic monitoring happening in the Beaufort Sea. We are continuing a little bit in the Chukchi um, through part of our chaos project with NOAA. Um, but there, it is something that we are looking into um, as far as what is needed going forward uh, before um, start the work begins on Liberty. Thank you, Heather. I, I was particularly asking because the the topic in, in really general terms came up last week at the IRPIC um, team leaders workshop. So maybe that's an area that uh, deserves uh, further consideration and discussion. Um, Daniel? I'd like to ask if anyone else on the line has questions for Kathy. Uh, Danielle, this is Sue. It's not really a question so much as just to let folks know that NOAA has an ocean noise station in the Beaufort Sea now. It was reported out, and there's a paper out by uh, Samantha Haver. This is west of the area that you're talking about. It's over uh, closer to Smith Bay, but it is a reference noise station that is uh, projected to be out there for a good long time. And in Samara's paper, she points out how quiet uh, the waters of the Beaufort can be, especially when ice is present, and how much that changes when it's open water. So we are, NOAA is establishing this noise reference system uh, throughout the United States uh, EED. Uh, Sue, so, so is that um, station um, recording um, directional information or just um, amplitude? Amplitude. We don't have directional information because there aren't enough recorders, but I can send along a link uh, to inform people on that. Thank you. 